Hi everybody and everybody hi! Welcome back to my channel Birdiology and today we will learn about the four species of lovebirds that belongs to the iron family. In this video you will also learn how to spot hybrids so no one can sell you overpriced birds. So fasten your seat belts everybody because this is Identifying the four iron lovebirds and their hybrids. Rise up this morning, I on my feet, walking down the doorway into the street. Welcome to my journey. In my last video, we learned that there are 9 species of lovebirds that belong to the Agapornis family. Agapornis is the scientific name of African lovebirds. Agape, that means love, and Ornis means birds. In those 9 species, 4 of them are irings. Basically, an iring is just a thick white skin that surrounds the bird's eye and this is a trait that the 5 non-iring species of lovebirds don't have. It is also called the periophthalmic ring. The 4 species are Agapornis personatus, Agapornis fishery, Agapornis nigrogenis, and Agapornis lilianae, and they are all native to Africa. The first species we will talk about is the Agapornis personatus. It is also known as the black mask lovebird, yellow collared lovebird, personata, and breeders just call it perso. The personatus is native in the northeast and central Tanzania and can be found in grasslands and woodlands near body of waters. The personatus is one of the most beautiful amongst other lovebird species. It has a very striking colors and these birds are less aggressive and this makes them a good pet and you can breed them easily. They don't show aggression on their youngs even they have already hatched their second clutch. I personally love the personatus. First time I saw them, it reminded me of Rastafarians. Think of Jamaica or play reggae music when identifying the personatus. So, the first one to look at is the head. You can easily identify all of birds by just looking at the markings and the color of their head. The head color is jet black, it can be up to the ears and resembles a mask. That's why it is also called the black mask lovebird. It can also extend to the back of the head and can also extend a bit downwards to the neck. And this depends on the quality of the bird. Its beak is red and gets a little bit darker red as it comes in maturity. It has a white sear or nose and white periophthalmic ring with black or dark brown eyes. It has a bright yellow neck, also called yellow collar, up to the back of the neck and has a bib that extends to the breast and sometimes much longer bib that almost covers half of their body. Their body is lighter green and their wings and back have darker green. The bend on the wing is also yellow, and the rump. Always get familiar with the color of the rump of each species. This can help you recognize hybrids, and we will talk more about this later. The color of the rump of the personatus is gray or sometimes grayish blue. The tail is mostly green and has black barrings while it has orange in the center. You will see this when you spread the tail. It has a gray feet and black nails. The next one is the Agapornis fishery, also known as Fischer lovebird. It is named after a German explorer named Gustav Fischer. This is the person who discovered the bird in the early 1800s. They are native in North Tanzania, just below the largest lake in Africa, the Lake Victoria. Some fishers move to the northwest in drought years in Rwanda and Burundi in seek of the moist conditions. Many color mutations originated in the Fisher's lovebird. It is also popular as pets and can easily breed. They are larger in size amongst the eye ring family, slightly larger than the personatus. And what I observe about Fisher's is that they are way more aggressive and territorial amongst the three eye ring species. They bite hard and very protective on their eggs. They really can get aggressive on their youngs when they want to start to lay eggs again and this can cause serious injury or death to the chicks. Now, about its appearance. Fishers have similarities to the personatus. They both have the same body color, 
gray feet and black claws, white periophthalmic ring, dark eyes, white seer, and that bright red beak. The difference is recognizable in the head. Fishers don't have black head. They have orange faces starting in the forehead downwards to its bib. In the wild type fisher, it has a yellow bib. Fishers also has a dark olive hood from the crown downwards to the back of the neck. In the wild type, it turns into yellow halfway in the back of its neck. About its rump, wild type fishers have bright blue rump and the tip of its tail is also blue, while in the shoalbirds, their rump became grayish blue just like in the personatus. This is the wild type green fisher and because of selective breeding and show standards, it became a much colorful and beautiful bird. Now, let's learn about the Agapornis nigrigenis, very well known as the black cheek lovebird. It was discovered by Dr. Kirkman in 1904, and black cheek lovebirds are endemic to southwestern Zambia. There are sightings in Botswana and could possibly be breeding in northern Zimbabwe near rivers and lakes. Sad truth about these birds is the decline of their population. They are the most threatened of all lovebird species in the wild. They were considered as crop pests and were trapped and sold in illegal pet trade and the loss of their habitat because of agriculture and their water sources are drying. But in captivity, black chicks are easy to take care and breed. The only problem is their purity. They were crossbred with other species of lovebirds and this is also one factor for the decline of their species. About their appearance, at first glance, many people mistakenly identify black cheeks as personados or the black mask lovebird because they have almost the same black markings in their head and this causes confusion and wrongfully pairing two different species of lovebirds causing hybridization. So get yourself familiar with the differences of these two species so we can prevent hybrids and save the black cheek from extinction. Just by its name, you already know that it has a black cheek. It covers mostly of the face area and has a brownish orange forehead and a tiny orange or salmon colored bib. The nape on the back of its neck up to the head is darker green or olive. They have green body and back. Flight feathers are black with a bit of green. They have gray feet and black claws. Now, I want you to remember these following traits that separates the black cheek lovebirds from the personados and fishers. Eyes of black cheeks have gray or light brown iris and a black pupil. Breeders call it the snake eyes. Their beak is also red, but it fades into a pinkish or fleshy color near its sear or nose. Lastly, the rump. Black cheeks don't have a blue or gray rump. Their rump has the same color as their back. So, if you see these traits, you probably have a pure bird. Black cheeks are also smaller than other lovebirds. Next is the Agapornis lilianae or Lilian's lovebird. It is named after Lilian Sclater, a naturalist and daughter of Philip Sclater, a best-known zoologist, and her brother, William Sclater, a famous ornithologist. It is also known as the Nyasa lovebird. It is endemic to Malawi formerly known as Nyasa land, and that's where they got the name Nyasa. They are also found in southern Tanzania, northern Zimbabwe, and eastern parts of Zambia and northern Mozambique. Because of their small population in the wild, the Nyasa lovebird is also a near-threatened species, just like the black cheek lovebird. They were also considered as pests and were sold in the pet trade and their loss of habitat. Another thing about the Nyasa is that they are hard to breed and keep in captivity. There are lots of myths about it. One is that they carry a throat mite that is only neutralized by their diet in the wild. In captivity, they cannot eat their natural diet causing death because of these mites. But there is no scientific proof about this. There are also reports about all their birds dying without a specific reason. Today. There are breeders that are successful in breeding these birds, maybe because of hybridization, making them stronger to disease and stress. Not like other eyerings, both male and female build their nest and their nest box must be L-shaped. A tunnel running from the entrance down to the cavity formed at the bottom of the nest box, where the eggs will be laid later. 
About the appearance, you may mistakenly identify Lilianes as fishers. They are very similar at first glance, but don't get confused. They are very different. They are more similar to the black cheek clovebird. They have all the same traits except they only differ in their faces. They have snake eyes, red beaks that fades near its nose, a green body, gray feet, black claws, and they don't have a blue or gray rump, just green. Their face has a salmon orange red color and a olive to green hood. It is easier to remember if you think of black cheeks, just remove the black on its face and you got a Lillian's lovebird. Because of their similarities, black cheek lovebirds were previously thought to be a subspecies of the Lillianae, but now it's considered a separate and distinct species. You now have learned how to identify the eye rings in their wild form, which is green. You may want to get yourself familiar with the blue series. Basically, bluebirds will also have the same traits as their ancestors and will look the same except for their color. The green turns to blue or violet to black, while the yellow and red turns to white. The blue mutation originally came from the Personatus and was transmutated to the three iron species by hybridization. What is hybridization? It is the interbreeding of two different species. If those two species had offsprings, those offsprings are called hybrids. These hybrids will inherit the traits and behaviors of the two different species. In the wild, hybridization can cause the decline and extinction of a species. Hybrids may become resistant to diseases and become much stronger. They may become invasive and dominate their ancestors. Lovebirds in their natural habitat cannot interbreed with other species of lovebirds because of natural barriers like mountains, forests, and bodies of water that separates each species from each other preventing hybridization. On the other hand, in captivity, hybridization is already a very big problem. Try to visit a pet shop and I assure you that you will find a hybrid. Pet owners who are new to breeding makes this mistake of hybridizing their birds without their knowledge. Some breeders also sell their hybrids that were used in transmutation for a very very low price. A hybrid shouldn't be used for breeding. It is very hard to look for a pure bird these days. You need to look for a reputable and a trusted breeder that keeps records of his birds to get a pure bird. Because even a pure looking bird may carry genes of another species and it will appear on its offspring. Just like this wild type looking personatus that I got from a pet shop. I bred it and all of its offsprings turned out as hybrids. If you already have hybrids, just keep them as pets and don't use them in breeding. There is a proper way of hybridization and it's a very very long process that it's called transmutation. It is also a hybridization but the goal is to transfer a color mutation to another species of lovebird. And we will learn about this in the next video so make sure to subscribe to stay updated. Now, let's learn how to identify the hybrids of the iring lovebirds. It is easy to identify hybrids if you already are familiar with the wild forms of each species. So try to master the colors and traits of these birds because it will be your foundation for breeding and it will be the key in understanding the different mutations of the Agapornis lovebird. The most common hybrid is the cross between the Personatus and the Fisher's lovebird. These two species are easy to find and acquire. Aviaries and pet shops surely have them. There are lots of mutations that originated from the fishery and each time a new mutation is acquired, the race is on for breeders to transmute that mutation to the Personatus and to the other species. Imagine how many hybrids were created. Tons. Lots of it. And some will end up in your aviary. So, back to the Perso Fisher hybrid. Easiest way to spot hybrids is by looking for unusual markings or colors on the head, mostly black and orange. A hybrid Personatus will have orange tint on its front yellow color. The color must be purely yellow from front to back without orange or green. Some young birds have a thin orange just below the black mask that will fade away after molting or when it reaches maturity. 
If it didn't go away, it may be a sign of hybridization. A hybrid perso can also have green or olive in the back of the neck similar to the three eye rings. You will also see orange tint on the forehead and other parts of the black head. Too much blue on the rump and on the tip of the tail may be a sign too. The rest of the body is the same with fishers, it will be difficult to compare. In the blue series, it will be harder to distinguish. Unlike in the green, you can still see tiny details of hybridization like the orange tint on the bib. You will not see this in the blue, so we only have to look for black and white markings. We only have two parts to look, the head and the back of its head. Patches of white in the head and forehead is a sign, and a duller color of the black mask that doesn't get darker until maturity is also a sign. And lastly, the back of the neck must be white without the grayish hood that fishers have. Hybrid Fishers Hybrids of the fishery are easy to identify because fishers doesn't have black markings on their face. Any tint of black is an indicator that your fisher is a hybrid. A fisher with a dull black mask is surely a hybrid. Some fishers will hide this in their maturity, but you will still see little clues of hybridization. What I look for is a thin black tinge that surrounds the outer part of the periophthalmic ring and a dark patch under the ears. A dark black color on the back of the head that resembles a personatus is also a sign. Too much green on the back of the neck may be a sign of a Lilianae heritage. In the blue series, the forehead and the face down to the bib should be white. We call them madre or nuns because they resemble a veil and the white is clearly separated from the white. Any black on the front is a sign of a hybrid. This blue fisher had a dirty face when she was young. After molting, you can see that most of the black on her face was gone, but the black that surrounds the periophthalmic ring still remains. She also have the black cap on the back of the head that looks like personatus. There is also a hybrid that looks pure. This is the sable. It's not a mutation, it is a selection of hybrids of the fisher and the personatus. It has no black in its entire head. It may look like an opali mutation, but these two are totally different. Hybrids of the black-cheeked lovebird Now that you already have ideas how traits of different species show up, it is also similar to the nigogenis or the black-cheeked lovebird. Because they can be easily misidentified as personatus, some mistakenly breed these two species together, creating hybrids. Just remember the three traits of the nigogenis, the snake eyes, the red beak that fades to a fleshy color near the nose, and the missing rump. If you see a blue or gray rump, it is a hybrid of the fisher or the personatus. Too much black on the head to the back is a sign of personatus, and too much orange in the neck could be fishers or of the lilianae. Without the snake eye and the fading red beak, it would mean it is a cross with other species. Lastly, the Lilianae. Just like the similarities of black cheeks and black mask, Lilianaes also have color similarities with the fishers, but I find them more similar to the black cheek because they also have the traits like the eyes, beak, and the green rump. Lilianaes don't have yellow on their neck, just like this example. You see a yellow on his chest? It also looks bigger and looking a lot like fishers. The only hint is the red face. It is a lot smaller and looking a lot like Lilianae. Young birds may have a dull black tinge on the face and cheeks that goes away after its first molt. If it stays until maturity, possibly that is a hybrid. Bluebirds may darken the eyes and have a flesh-colored beak, so the only clue is the rump and its size. The rump must be with the same color as the back. So any different color is a hybrid. If the height and body size is bigger than usual, it is also a crossbreed. There is also a mutation that is confusing to the untrained eye. It is the Lutino. Because Lutinos doesn't have eumelanin or the black coloring on feathers, it is easy to misidentify each species especially when you don't see a black mask or a dark hood. The Lutino mutation originated from the Lilianae and was transmutated to the other three species. Lutino in the fourth species will have the same yellow body color, white flight feathers, and red to orange head and tail. 
Let's discuss the traits that differentiate each species. Let's take a look at the Lutino Personatus. A Lutino Personatus will have a light orange head. It is lighter because in the wild form, it has a black head mixed with a little bit of orange the orange breeders try to remove. Take away the eumelanin and you will be left with that light orange. That orange mass shouldn't go down the bib just like in the wild form. In the fissures, the orange in the forehead to the bib will stay same as the wild form. The back of the head and neck is yellow and it could also be orange. These are the sable Lutino fissures. Now about the Lutino nigrigenis. The orange will start in the forehead to the cheeks narrowing down to the bib. When you look closer to the cheeks, it will have a pinkish color and on the face will have some white tinge. Only the Nigrigenis have that white tinge. In the Lilianae, the orange on the face will be reddish, starting in the forehead, in the face, to the back of the ears, and ends just above the bib. The reddish orange in the head is somewhat rounder, almost like a heart-shaped patch. The Nigrigenis and the Lilianae don't have a colored rump. It will be the same as its yellow back, while the Personatus and Fissures will have a little bit of white on the rump. Nigrigenis and Lilianae will also have the red fading beak and the light iris or the snake eye. It will still be visible in the red eye and in the dark eye. Personatus and Fissures still have the full colored red beak and will have red eyes or dark eyes. If you got confused about those Lutinos, here's another interesting bird to identify, the Eno Blue or the Albino. You may never identify the species of the Albino just by looking at it, because they will all look plain white. Well, you might see the snake eyes but you will still guess if it's a black cheek or a Lilianae. I also heard that the Albino Personatus have a pure white feathers while in the fishery, it will have a faint blue color in the body. You can also guess by the size and posture of its body and its behavior, but none of this is reliable. The only way to identify albinos is to ask the breeder. If you don't have any information about the bird, you need to test breed. Try to pair it with a pure wild form, and all the babies will be green. And if those offsprings don't have signs of hybridization, you can now identify that albino as the same species as its pair. And if those babies turned out as hybrids, you've got a wrong pairing. You may also encounter a different hybrid. A hybrid from the Agapornis rosicollis, a non-iring lovebird crossed with the iring family. Well, we really don't have a problem with this because these hybrids are sterile. They cannot reproduce. There are claims about breeding success about these hybrids, but lots of those who tried breeding them didn't have success and I'm thankful for that. Identifying these hybrids is a bit easy. Peach-faced lovebirds have white or fleshy colored beak. Any red coloration on the beak is a sign of a hybrid. Also, there shouldn't be black on their faces. Always check the skin on the eyes. There shouldn't be a periophthalmic ring there. Here's an example of a Lutino rosy collies. It may be looking a lot like a normal Lutino, because the Lutino mutation removes all the eumelanin or the black color in the feathers, you will not see the black tinge of a hybrid. But because the Rosicollis have white beaks, you can clearly identify Lutino hybrids by just looking at the color of the beak. Also remember that Rosicollis are bigger and wider than irings. These hybrids can also inherit the periophthalmic ring, but it will not be thick as the irings species. You might get confused by that iring, so check out the body build. Too big and unproportional body could indicate a hybrid. So, by this time, I'm sure you can easily identify each species and spot hybrids. If you see a bird and have doubts about the looks, and you see something out of the ordinary, trust your instincts. It's a hybrid. It's a hybrid. A hybrid. I encourage you not to breed these hybrids because there are too many hybrids by now, and it doesn't make sense breeding them. It, it just makes the quality of the bird low, and yeah, I think that's all about it for now. So make sure to subscribe to my channel to stay updated, and for those about to subscribe...
Goodbye, everybody, and everybody. Goodbye. God bless you, and happy bird keeping. Birdiology. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.